Mark 4, 26 through 34, the parable of the growing seed. He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. In our backyard, there are three trumpet vines that were being supported by the old cedar fence that was between our yard and the yard uh, next to us. Now, I have something of a love-hate relationship with this plant. We moved in, uh, when we moved in, uh, we built a trellis structure and a little playhouse underneath it for the boys to play in, and we went about the process of trying to train these trumpet vines to attach not to the fence, but to the trellis, which, as many of you already clearly know, that was easier said than was done. While, we're able, while we were able to get some of the new shoots to train themselves and attach to the new trellis, It was as if this vine knew that it had been ripped from its home on the fence, and it was not about to let go of the place that it wanted to be. After fighting with this thing for three summers, I am now convinced that it is a sentient life form that is out to make my life harder. (laughs) Yes, the bulk of the vine is now over the playhouse and giving my uh, children shade in the playhouse there, but there are these tentacles that keep reaching out for the fence, trying to pull itself back home like an ornery octopus with a thousand tentacles. And of course, I keep coming in and trying to hack off those tentacles to the best of my ability to train this bush to do what I want it to do. There is an ongoing test of wills between me and the trumpet vine, but recently that vine has taken the battle to a new level. The other day, I was sitting on our patio which is on the other side of our yard, a good 40 feet from this trumpet vine. And I looked at this bush, and I saw this vine growing up on the inside of it, and I thought, huh, that's interesting. That looks an awful lot like a trumpet. No. It can't, no, it can't can't possibly be. Now, most of you who have dealt with trumpet vines already know this, but yes, in fact, that trumpet vine had somehow sent down some sort of shoot or root or something, had tunneled across the entire yard, 40 feet of the yard, underneath the sidewalk, found the roots of this bush, and had come up in the middle of that bush. This thing does not want to go away. And Jesus spoke to the people saying, the kingdom of God, is like a trumpet vine that was cut back to the bare stump but began to grow again, sending up shoots in all directions, even tunneling across a yard and to grow up in a completely unexpected place. There was a historian in the first century named Pliny. And Pliny described a bunch of different things uh, about this world, including a lot of things about the natural world. And Pliny, in one of his writings, described the mustard plant as a, quote, hardy plant that tends to germinate rapidly and take over a garden. Or to put it in modern terms, mustard is a plant that is hard to kill. It won't go away, and it will dominate the rest of the space around it. These, are plant, these kinds of plants are also known as weeds. <laughs> Mustard plants and trumpet vines are not exactly the same kind of plant, but they do share some qualities. On one hand, they can both serve a certain purpose that we would like. Mustard produces mustard seeds that are wonderful spices. Uh, Trumpet vines are providing shade for my children. 
But on the other hand, these are both plants that are tough. They are tenacious plants that have a mind of their own, and they can actually wreck the surrounding landscape to a rather significant degree. Which means that it's kind of odd that Jesus would compare the kingdom of God to a mustard plant. And I say plant because the word tree isn't really the right word here. In other versions of the story, Jesus does actually say that the mustard plant becomes a tree, which it just kind of isn't. I mean, it's a big bush, which in terms of size of plants isn't necessarily the biggest and most impressive thing that you would go for if you're trying to make a metaphor about the kingdom of God. If you wanted to compare the kingdom of God to something big and strong, at least in the Bible, the metaphor that would be expected would be that you would compare it to the cedars of Lebanon. That's a fairly common metaphor in the Old Testament. (laughs) But the kingdom of God is like a mustard plant? I mean, a thing that's basically a big bush? A thing that is, quite frankly, kind of annoying to have around? Really? Really? It might be odd, but I think comparing the kingdom of God to a mustard seed and a mustard plant is actually telling us something important about the nature of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is tenacious. It's tough. It's hard to get rid of. It pops up in unexpected places. It's something that some people might actually really want to get rid of. And most importantly, it's something that starts small. There are many things that we can learn about the kingdom of God through this parable. But I think that one of the most intriguing things that we can learn actually has to do with the smallness of the kingdom of God. And I think we can really learn this lesson when we look at the whole section of parables that this story is a part of. This parable comes from chapter 4 in the Gospel of Mark. And in chapter 4 is the first set of parables that Jesus tells in his ministry. It's the first time he really is out there teaching publicly in parables. And what's fascinating to me is that when you look at the whole section in chapter 4, there's a larger message that starts to come out about the kingdom of God. And it's something that I think might be kind of odd to us at first. Chapter 4 starts with Jesus telling a parable about a sower who throws out seed on four different types of soil. Some of it fell on the path where the birds ate it up. Some of the seed fell on rocky ground that sprang up quickly uh, and then didn't have any roots, so it withered away very quickly as well. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns choked it out. But some seed fell on good ground, and it took root, and it produced, yielding 30 or 60 or 100 fold. And then Jesus says, "Let let anyone who has ears to hear listen, which is Jesus saying, wink, wink, nod, nod, know what I mean? After that, he tells, after telling the parable to the crowd, he then pulls his disciples aside, or his disciples pull him aside, and ask him about this parable. And then Jesus says something really strange and interesting. He says, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. Jesus basically says, I'm speaking in parables because I don't actually want them to understand what I'm saying. And then he goes on to explain the parable of the sower, except he just explains it to his own disciples. He says that the sower is the one who sows the word in the world, and the different kinds of grounds are the different kinds of people hearing the word. The ones on the path are the ones who uh, hear, but immediately Satan comes up and snatches away the word. The ones on rocky ground are the ones who hear the word and receive it with joy, but who don't really have roots, so they wither and fall away pretty quickly. The ones, the seeds that are sown in thorns are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and desires for other things choke out the word. And then those who are good soil are those who hear and accept the word and bear fruit 30 or 60 or 100 fold. Then, after the the explanation of this parable, he gives another parable. He says that when someone brings in a lamp, they don't put it under a bushel basket or uh, under the bed, but they put it on a lampstand. 
And he says, for there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. And then he says, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given you. For those who have, more will be given, and from those who have, even what they have will be taken away. Then we get to the first parable that we had for today, which is a parable that's only found in the Gospel of Mark. It's a parable about how the kingdom of God is like someone who scatters seed on the ground and then walks away, doesn't really do anything. In fact, kind of forgets about it, doesn't even know what the seed is doing until the time of harvest and then comes back. Then we have the parable of the mustard seed. And then at the end, there is this other note about how confusing and cryptic the parables are. It says, with many such parables, he spoke, to, spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Notice the pattern here. First is a parable about how not everyone who hears the word will actually understand it or do anything with it. Then Jesus explicitly says, I don't want everybody to know what I'm really saying. And then he does explain the parable, except it's in private to his own disciples. And then there's a parable about how some people will understand, and those who do understand will receive more understanding. Then is the parable about the kingdom, how the kingdom of God is hidden and even kind of forgotten about until the harvest. And then is the parable saying that the kingdom is like a tiny seed that you might not even know is there, but eventually grows and takes over the whole place. And then it wraps up by saying that Jesus spoke in parables to keep things confused and hidden. Now, each one of these parables on their own says something important to us about the kingdom of God, but I think when we take them all together, we get an interesting larger message. The kingdom of God is something that is not particularly obvious, and it's not big and bold. It's not something that is even understood by everyone out there. And it's for sure not accepted by the whole world around it. Instead, the kingdom of God is something that is often hidden from plain sight. It is something that confuses a lot of people. It's something that many people might even find difficult to understand and take a hold of. The kingdom of God is also often sneaky and tough and persistent. The kingdom of God is even sometimes unwanted because it will upset and infest and mess up the best laid plans by those who are in charge of the world. The first time in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus speaks in parables, he talks about the kingdom of God. And it's not only what he says, but the way he says it that shows us that the kingdom of God is a whole lot more hidden and subversive and unexpected, unexpected and maybe even smaller than we might think it is. So what does that mean <laughs> for us? What does it mean for us to be a part of that kind of kingdom? What does it mean for us to be a part of this small, sneaky, landscape-changing kingdom of God? What does it mean for us to be a tentacle of the trumpet vine of the kingdom? Well, there's at least a couple of things that I think these parables can teach us about life as a citizen of the kingdom of God. The first, I think, is to embrace that whole annoying troublemaker thing in the world. Last week, I talked about how the people of God are meant to be a people group and not a nation state, and how we must be very careful about merging the church and any government. And yes, it's true that we should be wary about the church becoming the state, but that doesn't mean we are to be silent. Part of our job is to be like that mustard seed, to have an impact on the, on the world in a way that must be attended to. I actually experienced a bit of that this week here with our own local city. On Tuesday morning, I went to the Wichita City Council meeting, and I was there as part of a very large group of people who went to advocate for a new water park to be placed at the McAdams Park to replace the pool that was closed there last year. A whole community of people came together to use their voice to try and hold the city accountable for the promises that it made uh, last year. And there was a bunch of people who were there. 
and kind of in your face and occasionally loud and maybe a little bit disruptive at times. I watched a whole group of people be like that invasive mustard plant. I also watched a city leadership, watched as the city leadership attempt to hack them down just like a weed and use the wheels of bureaucracy to try and get them out of the way. But I can also assure you that just like a weed, that community is going to come back again and press the city once more. For me, at least, it was one way that I see the kingdom of God creeping up into this world in order to make this world a little bit more just and a little bit more right, to disrupt the normal order of things, to bring the light of the kingdom. The other thing that I think these parables teach us is that we all need to embrace the smallness of the kingdom. Last Sunday night, we had our first Sunday evening worship time here at our church, and in the discussion time that we had, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about what it means for us to be weird or different because of following Jesus. And what I found really interesting in that discussion was that there were some people who shared about some pretty significant and serious life choices that they had made in their lives or with their families that were based on certain values, values that um, they hold dear and that were choices that really put them at odds with the world around them or made them feel very different. But then there were other people who shared about some of the small things that caught other people's ten attention and sort of unexpectedly made them feel a little bit weird. Like one person who shared about bringing a sack lunch when going out to eat with co coworkers, whereas everybody else was simply buying their lunch. And how that little act caught people's attention and made people think. What, what struck me about that whole conversation and also struck me about our scripture for this morning is that, that we all make small decisions that are based on our values, that are based on following Jesus faithfully. And sometimes those little choices seem mundane. They seem like they go unnoticed. Nobody else even knows that we're making them. And it might feel like that first parable from our scripture, like those choices are a seed that was planted and that people have ignored for a very long period of time while it's growing. But the truth is, those small choices really do make an impact on this world. And those small choices are often more noticed than we might think they are. Those small acts shape how we go through our life. And they add up. And when they add up, people notice. Even simple acts of faithfulness that we think go unseen, they can actually add up to be a surprisingly important witness to people in this world. And it never ceases to amaze me how a simple act that we thought that nobody was paying attention to can all of a sudden change someone else's life or thinking in the blink of an eye. See, I still firmly believe that the kingdom of God changes this world for the better. But I am often reminded by a whole host of scriptures that the kingdom of God is not something that is just going to come slamming down into this world in the future sometime, but rather the kingdom of God is something that is here and now. Something that slowly creeps into this world through the cracks. Something that is often small and unexpected. The kingdom of God is something that works its way in and changes the landscape of the whole world around it. I am reminded by scriptures that it is our role as Christians to be another vine, another mustard plant, another shoot springing up in an unexpected place, all of which is to bring about a little bit more of the kingdom in this world. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from the First Church of the Brethren in Wichita, Kansas. If you'd like to watch another video, click the link on the right. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video. And we'd love to have you join us on Sundays at 9.30 for Sunday school and 10.45 for worship. Everyone is welcome and you're invited.